Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Kepner and Gail Wilkinstein here with you from the LA Football Network. If this is your first time tuning in the show, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Dan Wilkenstein. We are officially just under 48 hours away from the combine drills officially kicking off. Get to get out there and see the players runner in Dan's case, how he likes to see him run and bench press at the same time. That's what he likes to do. But uh, as we had talked about, and as was updated earlier today, Chargers general manager Joe Hortiz took the stand for some interesting questions that he had some answers on that gave a little bit of light as far as free agency, as far as draft strategy. And Dan and I kind of wanted to break it down in this episode. Of course, before we do that, Dan Wolkenstein, first and foremost, sir, how are you? I am great. Uh... Honestly, optimistic was how we felt since Joe Hortiz and since Jim Harbaugh came. But some of these quotes and some of the things that he said today, I think really opened my eyes. It kind of got me really excited about free agency, about the draft and how they execute things and what they're looking at. So really, really fun episode today in terms of kind of a peek behind the curtains as to what is important and how he kind of makes decisions. He and they make decisions when it comes to NFL draft and roster construction. But Jake, before we get to that, let's pay the bills. Talk about our friends. Want to tell everybody about how to get into the action with all the sports that are out there. It's underdog fantasy in their pick'em game. Just pick higher or lower on your favorite or least favorite players. And you could win up to 20 times your money in a single night. Underdog keep it super simple with their easy-to-use website and mobile apps. Just pick between two and five players to fill out your pick entry. Get every pick right and take home some cold, hard cash. Just use the promo code UNLEASHED and get your first deposit doubled up to over $500 by Underdog. Go on over to Underdog Fantasy and let them know that Chargers Unleashed sent you. So Joe Hortiz is at the podium today for the NFL Combine and... A uh, friend of the show, Eric Smith, Chargers reporter, as well as Daniel Popper. And you've seen a lot of other shows that have had Joe Hortiz on as a guest uh, ask a whole bunch of questions about this Chargers roster, NFL draft ideologies, uh, what the priorities are, wide receiver, offensive lineman, uh, you name it. And there have been a lot of key takeaways that we have heard from Joe Hortiz that may or may not have pump the brakes on some theories of who the team could possibly take. And it may have hit the gas <laughs> on some of the excitement on some of the other players that this Chargers team could take. Overall, Jake, I think I kind of start this one off. What's impressive to me about Joe Hortiz is like when you hear him talk, you could tell how much experience this guy has and he rattles this stuff off like it's his bedtime story that he has memorized for the last 20 years about how he wants to construct teams and how important depth is on a roster and how that is an example of how teams can overcome is how deep they are. Teams will get injured and how you can push through that and build a roster that can withstand some of that uh, attrition is so vital. And hearing him talk about just drafting good players, you can never have enough of them, even if it's in the same position. And talking about things like BPA that we've all been clamoring for, it's exciting. And so when when Joe Hortiz talked today, there was stuff that I think Chargers fans were like just, you know, glued to see if they would hear anything about. First one for me, Jake, was a lot of people are connecting dots between Joe Hortiz and the Ravens and Jim Harbaugh and the the physicality that this team brings in and, and how important the run game is and building through the trenches, which all of that is true. But people have threaded that needle, pulled that string to then interpret it as essentially paraphrasing Joe Alt at five. <laughs> Joe Hortiz today, Jake, maybe pump the brakes on that just a little bit. It it definitely made me feel good to hear him kind of elaborate and interpret this for, you know, the, obviously everybody was there that, that was there asking questions in this regard is, and to see here, to hear him acknowledge 
how deep of an offensive line class this is, whether we're talking about the tackle position, the center position, the guard position, whatever it is, it's factual that this offensive line class is extremely deep. And as I know that we'll get into some other quotes that he had said here just in a little bit, I think it piggybacks off of this just in terms of he's not saying at all that the Chargers are not going to try to reinforce this offensive line. It just doesn't mean that he necessarily has to do it at five. And so for him to go down and acknowledge that and for people to kind of get an idea of what the board is going to look like four picks ahead of the Chargers, you can kind of start doing the math. Now, does it mean that it's an absolute possibility that or absolute certainty that he is going to go off not drafting an offensive line at five? No. But hearing him say what Dan and I have said, what many others have said, just in terms of you can either trade back to get an offensive lineman if that indeed is your target, or you can go out and get that center of the future, whether it's later in the first, second, third, fourth, you can re reinforce this offensive line. It doesn't have to be at five. So it put a big smile on my face to see him acknowledge that. Yeah. Uh, this is from Eric Smith's article. We gave some takeaways from this one. Uh, here's a quote. I'd say that it's pretty deep uh, when Cortez was asked about the depth in the offensive line group. It's weird. I get this question a lot every year leading up to the draft. It seems like there's players that every round, certainly in the offensive line, that there are some other deep positions in the draft too. It seems to be a lot most years, the same positions, wide receiver every year. We're starting to put out more and more wide receivers because of the way college football has changed. But yeah, it's a good depth draft for the offensive line. So a lot of people talk about Joe Alt. You know, maybe they trade down into, you know, 8, 10, 12, whatever. Maybe they go later for JPJ. But straight from the horse's mouth, this is a deep draft for offensive line which may play into the possibility or the lack of importance in getting one at five. This is the one that got me excited, Jake. Here we go. Joe Hortiz was on uh, pro football talk. I was talking to Chris Sims and company about kind of draft strategy and was talking about, I was asked about kind of BPA and what you're doing at number five and, It was something that I think Chargers fans have been begging for, especially the ones who were looking for a certain skill position. Quote, you take the best player available because you're never, ever one player away. Now, when you hear you take the best player available at five because you're never, ever one player away, Jake, who would you say would be a best player available or two or three, possibly there at five? I mean, you start with Malik Neighbors. That's where that's where that's where my mind initially would go. Yeah, you can throw in Brock Bowers in that circumstance just because of if we're talking about that type of a player. Now, again, we have no idea what the Chargers' big board obviously looks like as it stands right now, and it will obviously change over the next couple of months. But you'd have to believe that it's pretty damn full with all the holes that they have to fill on the roster. <laughs> so <laughs> whatever position it is, you know that it's lined from the top to the bottom with prospects in terms of which way that they want to go. Dan, it's, it's, it's more of an elaboration from this quote that he, he spoke about after this, it just in terms of like, that's how you build the roster moving forward. You're never, the, the, he said, he even went on to say, the roster is never where it, it needs to be. You never stay content with the roster the way it is. It always can need building, reinforcement, other ways to find it to way to look better. And I think when you look at it in terms of, how the previous regime prioritized how to build rosters. And then you hear the way that Joe Hortiz is talking about this now. I mean, this is something that the Chargers have lacked for so long. And yes, while they had talent, they were very top heavy. And yes, part of this goes into the whole coaching acumen where it does take that. And he went on to say that he felt that good teams can overcome injuries, which 
I have said this on the show years ago. Good coaching can trump injuries if you develop those players well. And unfortunately, the Chargers haven't had depth and they haven't had the coaching acumen to overcome those those injuries. So this just is, as Dan said, a peek behind the curtain as far as the foundation that Joe Hortiz is building on not how do you get better as a whole as a team, but how do you build that depth behind it so that if an injury does occur, it's not just a drop from one end of the spectrum to the other in terms of production. Yeah, on the on the note, and I thought this was something that was so refreshing to hear from a general manager, <clears throat> was, and I'll read a little snippet from the Eric Smith article. Again, if you haven't gotten a chance to look at it, he gave a ton of insight here. I think that you're working to get the roster to where you want it every single day. That's leading up to the draft, certainly. We're going to be taking a draft-centric approach. I believe in that. But unrestricted free agency, June free agency, signings right before August, during the roster, during the season, excuse me, turning the roster during the season, Cortese added, the roster should never be where you want it. You're always trying to move ahead and get it. We're going to continue to work to add pieces, but we're going to do it throughout the year at all times of the year. Now, Jake. We talked about this in season, many seasons, <clears throat> at all times of the year. It seemed to me, it seemed to you, and it seemed to many, once it came down to August, kind of felt like twiddle thumbs. Until the end of December, in terms of bringing in free agents to help fill out this roster. Just this past year, we had been clamoring for help <laughs> in the secondary. We had been clamoring for help when Joey Bosa went down. We had been clamoring for help at the wide receiver position. And not a single name that was really known by anybody other than UDFAs or waiver wire pickups were brought into this team. Bryce Callahan did not walk through that door. Contrast that fitting. Kyle Van Noy picked up weeks into the season by, oh, I don't know, the Baltimore Ravens this past year. He goes on to have a career year with the Baltimore Ravens because the Baltimore Ravens set him up for success. He brought his prowess, his experience, and the Ravens were doing it at all times of the year. I know we're talking about the draft, but that was something to me that I do not remember an in-season transaction that had any juice to it. Any. Like, if, maybe this is hindsight here, but am I missing something? Did we ever see that? I'm sure it happened, but like, when was the last time it happened? It's it's been the the only one that I could ever recall, and it's funny because there was clips on this particular individual that it came across the Twitter feed. Uh, I want to say it was on Saturday. The last in season trade that I remember the Chargers doing, where you're like, "Yo, wasn't even even." In this previous regime, Dan, it was when the Chargers traded for Chris Chambers. Oh, that's the name was that's the name that came to mind. That was the last one that I remember in season that you were like, hey, like that's one to pay attention to. Jalen Since, Hawkins, that's the name. <laughs> Waiver wire it, pickup. It, it, it's I think it's a I think it's a combination, Dan, of again at the end of the day, you're getting good football players you're bringing talent into the team yeah. in the case of kyle van Oy, you're doing it in the best possible way considering the timing of the pickup considering the price tag that it ended up costing and look at the dividends that you ended up getting from a veteran presence like him to mix with that young defensive line this is smart football team building here this is an example of it 
This is what Joe Hortiz has been around in Baltimore for the past 26 years. Tell me that you're not excited about this type of acumen and mindset coming and sitting in this GM seat with what this team, this franchise, this fan base has had to witness for the last decade. On the pro football talk, or pro football focus, pro football talk, yeah, pro football talk, excuse me, it was Chris Sims. Uh, Chris Sims kind of pressed Joe Hortiz a bit and asked specifically about kind of the wide receiver position at five and what that looks like when maybe the best player available might be at a position that you may have a strong suit at. And Chris Sims had talked, Chris Sims was asking, okay, well, what about like receiver, for example, for you guys? You know, you got maybe like three good ones. Does that change or affect who you draft at five if your BPA or BPAs are in that position? And he talked about like, this is like a lot of this is about creating great depth on your team and being able to sustain the long season and the injuries that presumably will come. And we have seen it firsthand covering this team. Injuries completely derail a season. Now, should you expect to lose your wide receivers two, three, four, one? Like some some injuries become insurmountable, but you create great depth. And he had said specifically with the guys that were mentioning with those receivers, like some of them may be a little older, like injuries could happen and you want to be able to be able to sustain that. And so wide receiver to me is very much in play. And I would argue it's probably more in play after the comments from Joe Hortiz today. I want to actually read the full quote on that, Dan, because I think that was key. There was a term that Hortiz used in his quote that I thought was fitting to especially the pod that we had yesterday and talking about all these different trade scenarios and targets and priority and who could be on the board at that point in time. This was his actual quote in regards to what Dan was just talking about. Hortiz said, you really don't want to pigeonhole yourselves because we're weak at this one position. So I have to address this. I don't think that's the smart way to do it. You got to have depth all around. Pigeonholing is a term that I've used a couple times since we've been talking about this as it relates to the NFL draft. Dan wants Malik neighbors more than anything in the world for the Chargers. And so do a bunch of other people. I would love to see Brock Bowers on this team. We both would be okay with both, by the way. Yes. (laughs) I know a lot of us would like to see a trade down in that scenario. But again, the Chargers in this particular circumstance, they're not just a Marvin Harrison Jr., a Malik Neighbors, a Brock Bowers. They're not one player away from contending in the AFC right now. So in this particular circumstance, as he's talking about, in building depth, yes, you got to go out and you get great players. But you also have to build great depth in that circumstance in order to overcome those injuries, which, look, we're Chargers fans. Those injuries are going to come. It's like Thanos. They are inevitable. They will be there. So do try not to pigeonhole our, uh, you know, just Dan, myself, everybody. Try not to pigeonhole yourselves into just one guy, even as badly as you want them. Because this team needs so much. All I would say is sit back, enjoy the ride, and put a little bit of faith into this front office when it comes to these decisions. Yeah, because I think they deserve it. Their track record speaks for itself. And so when they when you hear you take the best player available because you're never, ever one player away. Perfect timing. Daniel Jeremiah just put out his updated top 50 prospects. So let's talk about it for a quick sec here. BPA, okay? We'll skip their quarterbacks. Quarterbacks one, two. Excuse me, quarterbacks one. Marvin Harrison ranks number two. Surprisingly, Roma Dunze, number three. Daniel Jeremiah is a big fan of Roma Dunze. 
I'll give a quick snippet here. Thrives in traffic, possesses the ability to pluck the football and absorb big shots over the middle of the field, and makes some incredible adjustments on poorly thrown balls, tracks naturally over shoulder. After the catch, he is very tough to bring down, has some nifty make-miss ability, plays with a ton of passion and energy overall. Odunze is a complete player and reminds him of Larry Fitzgerald coming out of college, which is also pretty hilarious because there's another receiver <laughs> right above him that reminds everybody of Larry Fitzgerald. So, hey. Maybe, maybe the Cardinals say, you know what, Robo Dunze, that's who we're going to go. That was, that, can you imagine if that happened, by the way? Um, after that, Malik Neighbors at number four. He's up from seven, by the way. So ranked fourth on his big board. Neighbors is a dynamic receiver without any competitiveness in production. Explodes off the line his release, creating immediate separation. He sets up defenders before snapping off his route. Isn't afraid to work the middle of the field. Strong hands to finish through contact. When working back to the quarterback, he prefers to let the ball travel into his body, but his drops are limited. He can scoop low throws off his shoes, easily adjust to balls on his back hip. He does a lot of damage on slot fades where he uses his speed to it early, and he tracks the ball with ease. After the catch, he explodes through tackles and also has a nasty stiff arm. Overall, Neighbors is an electric playmaker. That's my guy, by the way. Okay, so that's fourth on the prospect list. Five, Drake May. Six, Jaden Daniels. Two other quarterbacks. Number seven, Jake's guy, Brock Bowers. Which, you talk about BPA meeting a need. This Chargers team, like, they're Stone Smart and Donald Parham Jr. are their tight ends right now. With a run blocking, pass blocking that was... Not well great. below average. <laughs> Not great. He says he reminds him a lot of George Kittle and sees him having similar impact. He has the speed to pull away, attacks the ball in the air, quick to transition. His greatest asset is his tackle breaking power. He runs through contact without gearing down. An effective run blocker when he can get his hands on opponents, but will get pressed out of longer armed edge rushers. And he lined up all over the field of Georgia in the line on the wing, split out, even at running back. He's an undersized tight end, but has elite speed, strength, and playmaking ability. Notice we have not talked about an offensive lineman and would not until you get to number nine with Joe Alt, number 10, Fuaga. So I know everyone has a different big board. Everyone's best player available might be different. But I'm going to say it, Jake. There's no way in hell that they, he, whoever it is making decisions collectively has Joe Alt as a better player available than Malik Neighbors or Roma Dunze or Brock Powers, in my opinion. I Look, I understand. I think everybody, the first thing that they're thinking about here is Jim Harbaugh and how he likes to build through the trenches and beef up that offensive line. Greg Roman, priorities running the ball. Like All of these things make sense when you start to put these things together in terms of getting better offensive line performance. I get all that. But I retort back with a little bit of what Joe Ortiz was talking about today in terms of the salary cap. Because he was talking about, you know, he, he wouldn't elaborate on the big four contracts that still needed to obviously get taken care of before March 13th. But obviously, the Chargers need to get under the salary cap by that point in time. So whether it is five days from now, seven days from now, the night before March 13th, they're going to have some difficult decisions to make in that circumstance. Now, as we have talked about on the show, because for everybody that is selecting Joe Alt or any other offensive lineman for that matter. If your plan is to bring them in and essentially either make Trey Pipkins one of the highest priced backups <laughs> in the NFL as it stands right now, or you release him and eat another $10 million in salary cap space, I don't really see that after you would spend all that time getting out from that hole that you're currently in, in the salary cap, that you would then add more onto it. That logistically to me just doesn't make sense. So I fully understand everybody's connection to offensive line. 
I, I truly do. And I'm not even saying that it's, com- that it's, a, it's a bad idea to go after it in the draft. I just wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it at five. If we're talking about a trade down scenario, I think that, that it's a hundred percent more likely. That was my so question I'm, for you, Jake, where, so how, like it seemed in my, in my eyes, it seems like 10 to 15 is like going to be the run on tackles ish. I don't want to be ahead of that, <laughs> but I know if you, if you end up too late, you're going to miss out on some, but like if they trade to eight, are you okay with getting offensive tackle then? Even still, just still because when, the, the way that you start it. thinking about how the board's going to be. Look, the Chargers, as it stands right now, whether three quarterbacks are taken or two are taken, or four. regardless if it's for a wide receiver or a quarterback, the Chargers are going to be in prime position to move. And as we had just heard about some rumblings today, as far as Minnesota goes with some certain coaching moves that they made. Mm-hmm. I think it's only fitting, Dan, also that none of the big three quarterbacks are throwing this week's combine, which means the show now belongs to J.J. McCarthy, Bo Nix, and Michael Penix Jr., which is fantastic if you're the Chargers. I think Bo Nix might ball out. I think he's the guy that... I know J.J. McCarthy is the one that might skyrocket into that next tier during come draft time, but Bo Nix might be the player that blows people away at the combine. Daniel Jeremiah had said last week that hypothetically, as far as the Chargers go for five, he said they, be the Chargers, have to be praying that another one of those quarterbacks from that second tier elevates their draft stock here in the next two months. This is the opportunity to do that. Yeah. JJ McCarthy, Bo Nix, come on down. Come on down, make it a race. So, Quick one today, but just wanted to kind of go through some of the snippets we heard from a one Joe Hortiz. Uh, last thing on this, Jake, a couple other names that we saw on this list. Uh, Adonai Mitchell, A.D. Mitchell, comes in on this list at 33, just outside of the first round. Another receiver I like, Zach Frazier, has now become a first-round number, up five spots, number 32, which I know is tough for a lot of Chargers fans to see. Uh, a couple of the names, JPJ is now up to 29. So another center, six spots up. Jerzon Newton, actually, his he's at 28 now, the interior defensive lineman. Remember when he was like up in the 15s? Your boy, Nate Wiggins, Jake, up to 25. Love Nate Wiggins, by the way. Corner would be an interesting one. Uh, Rake Straw up to 23 now. Yes. Latu now at 20. But like I said, the offensive tackle, this is these numbers that once you get to nine, Joe Alt at nine, Talisi Fuaga at 10, Dallas turn of the edge at 11, back to tackle, Fashanu 11, or excuse me, 12, JC Latham 13. This is a lot of receivers, excuse me, receivers, tackles. Try Troy Fatanu, Fautan, Fatanu. I'm going to mess that name up until the draft comes. 17. My guy, Brian Thomas Jr., the wide receiver, now at 16. 16. Jane Daniels had two of the top 16 players on the board. He was throwing two. That's insane. So, anything else, Jake? This was a Joe Horty special. Uh, the draft is coming. But I think, and this is why the Ravens have yeah, always been so enough. dang good, is they draft good football players, man. They don't care where they play as long as they play well and they fit what this team's looking to do. So look forward to that for this Chargers team. Anything else, Jake, before we had here? I'm so ready for a combine. And as we alluded to yesterday in the pod, we're so excited for what this next six days, I'm not just talking about the events. I'm talking about some additional things that will be here on Chargers Unleashed. Very excited for what we've got in store for you over this next week. So make sure to tune in. So excited for some of these uh, specials that we're going to be having here on the show. And of course, we'll delve into everything that we can as it relates to the NFL Combine as the week progresses. Oh, damn. This is where it's like, we're in the midst of it right now. Let's go to work. We're in Jake's happy place. So let's all have fun together. For Jake Hefter, find him at Jake T. Hefter. Myself at Dan W. Sports. Happy Combine Week to everybody. And we'll talk to you next time on Star-
Chargers Unleashed.